Well, happy new year to you guys. So glad you guys are here with us today. You're here on a holiday weekend, which means you get a gold star with Jesus. I'm just saying. Don't go look at it. That's not in the Bible. I know. I made it up. But anyways, glad to have you guys here and uh, hope you had a great holiday uh, Hope you've had a great holiday season. I hope it's been a good one for you. This has been such a real, it's just been such a fun season for us as a church. We're coming off, I think, some incredible Christmas Eve gatherings um, just a couple of weeks ago now. And I realize that some of you, you had your very first experience with our church at our Christmas Eve gatherings, and uh, you're back again today for the first time. And so I just want to give you a very warm welcome and say we are so glad to have you here with us. Today, we're going to take some time and actually just start our new year by just remembering what Christ has done for us. And we're going to do that by by taking communion together. I I don't know about you, um, but as many highlights as I got to experience in 2021, I don't know if you can relate, I'm kind of really glad, to be honest with you, man, I'm real glad to turn the page on 2021, put that thing behind us. Um, I'm real glad to be turning the page towards something new now in 2022. New Year's are real fun because New Year's in some ways, I mean, it's interesting because all that happens is the calendar, you know, it just becomes January 1st, and yet it's like a whole new you know, potential is out there for us. It's almost like a new year gives us a clean slate. And so many of you are, are taking time right now because I've, I've seen it and you've talked to me and I've seen that you post about it and all that kind of stuff. You're taking time to kind of evaluate and go, okay, what do you want? What do we want? What do I want for 2022? New years give us an opportunity to look ahead. It gives us an opportunity to kind of go, hey, it's a blank slate. What are my goals? What are the things we want to accomplish? What are the, what's the change we want to see happen in our life? And I'm all for that. But I also know that there is a really big difference between just setting goals for our year and accomplishing those goals. Setting the goals, you know, that's the easy part. But accomplishing, that's a different thing. I don't know how Christmas works in your home, um, but for us, in our home, the older Jenny and I get, receiving gifts, it's just kind of lost a little bit of its luster along the way. Because, and you're probably like this too, I mean, anything we really need, we just go out and buy ourselves. And so there's not a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of times we get to Christmas and be like, oh, I really would like this because we probably already bought it. And so for us, gifts tend to be really, really practical. Do you remember when you were a kid, by the way, and you would go to your grandparents' house and you would get socks and underwear? You had that one grandparent that would always give you socks and underwear and you're like, wait, are you, what, what the, are you kidding me right now? That's what you wanted to say, but your mom was looking at you, so you're like, thank you, grandmommy. And then, and then what happens though, the older you get, now you get those same gifts and you pull up and you're like, nice. Are these 100% wool? These are awesome. <laughs> so practical. But this year I got probably like in one of my gifts, it was attached to one of the gifts I got. I had included um, with one of the gifts, maybe the most practical gift I've ever gotten. This is what I got in one of my gifts. That's toothpaste, y'all. <laughs> Just a tube of toothpaste. And I do not have sensitive teeth. And I'm not a vegan, but I got vegan toothpaste for sensitive teeth, and I'm grateful. Now, now listen, I took a picture of it, though, uh, not because I was angry, although I was, but I took a picture of it because of that statement written on it. I don't know if you can see it, if you look at it real quick. Step one, set big goals. Step two, go get them. And I read that on that stupid bottle of toothpaste, and I sat there and go, it's never worked like that for me. Step one, set big goals. Step two, just go get them. In fact, if it were that easy, just set a goal related to the change that we want to see, and then step two, go do it, man, we would all have a lot more accomplishments underneath our belts, wouldn't we? And if you've you've never read any of James Clear, he's an author, a researcher, if you've never read any um, of James Clear's thoughts on how to go about accomplishing goals that you have for your life. Man, I would highly recommend checking out his work at some point, particularly his book, Atomic Habits. But one of the concepts that James Clear talks about is that anytime we set goals, there's really kind of three layers of behavior change that we need to take into account, that we need to account for. And so I'm just gonna show you this kind of illustration he uses. I think it's really helpful. And so when you think about it, this is what he would say. At the, at the outer level, those, are, those would be the outcomes what we want. Outcomes, right? So this is really the first layer of changing uh, of behavior. This is your, the outcomes you want. This is where we almost always exclusively focus our attention when it comes to goals. What are the goals? What are the outcomes we want? Um, the outcomes that we want for our lives. We want to lose weight. That's an outcome. We want to quit smoking. That's an outcome. We want to start exercising. We want to start, you know, we want to learn how to play an instrument. That's an outcome. The second layer kind of in, though, um, is 
your processes, changing your processes. So I'm just going to write process there. The processes that we have are like, those are the habits and the patterns that either work for or against the outcomes that we want. So this could be, you know, placing your Peloton in a spot in your home that's easy to get to, right? If you put your Peloton out in the shed out back, you're not going on a cold morning. You're not going to go out there. You're less likely. This could be, this process of that, that could be more like leaving your running shoes by your bed the night before. So when you get up, it triggers the behavioral response you want to exercise. This could be not drinking uh, caffeine, for instance, after a certain time in the day so that you can set yourself up for more rest or whatever. So that's kind of the processes, but the, the innermost layer is changing your identity. I'm just going to put ID right there. That's your identity. This is all about what you believe to be most true about you, what you believe about yourself, your self-image. And all of this has to work together in order to affect change in our life. And, and a good example of this, of all working together, might be if, if, if you were trying to quit smoking, and someone, you know, you're trying to quit smoking, that's the outcome you want, and you're trying to, you put some processes around you to make sure that you can help with that. And then someone asks you, do you want a cigarette? Now, there's two ways that you could respond to that question. One, one is, no thanks, I'm trying to quit smoking. That's an outcome-based response. I'm trying to quit. Or you could respond and say, no thanks, I'm not a smoker. That's an identity-based response. And we tend to focus on the outcomes. That, this is where we tend to put almost exclusively our energy when it comes to the goals, the change we want to see in our life. We put it on the outcomes. We pay less attention to the processes, and we pay even less attention to what we believe about ourselves. And this leaves us frustrated so many times because these have to all be working together in order to experience change. Now, here's why I'm telling you all this. We could take a lot more time. We could spend hours talking about, I think this kind of stuff is fascinating and about how change happens in our life and all that. This is not why I'm telling you all this. So why I'm telling you all this is because this little diagram right here, I think explains so clearly why some of us today are exhausted spiritually. We're tired spiritually. And for some of you, as you think about this coming year and you're beginning to think about what you want to see God do in your life in this coming year, you're beginning to take time, you're beginning to consider ways that you want to draw closer to God in this coming year. For some of you, this whole church and, you know, this whole church and Jesus thing is kind of new to you. Maybe Christmas was your first time to church in a long, long time, or maybe, you know, you've just started coming back. And, and so, but, but the reason you're coming back is because you've just felt something's missing in your life. You don't even know what it is. You've just felt a gap. You've felt a void. And and so you want to know what that is. And so this year you're like, I want, to, I want to dive into that a little bit. For some of you, it's in a particular area of your life that you want to see God work. Some of you, you're making commitments this year to saying, man, I, I just, I'm going to be a better follow, I'm going to be better at this whole following Jesus thing. This year I'm going to read the Bible more. This year I'm going to pray more. This year I'm going to stop looking at porn. This year I'm going to stop talking to my kids the way that I've been talking to them. This year I'm going to prioritize God and my finances. I'm going to start giving. This year I'm going to jump in and I'm going to start serving. All these are outcomes. And all of these are great things. But here's what happens. What happens is that we tend to keep the conversation based here at the outcome level, focused on these outcomes without ever considering what we fundamentally believe to be true about ourselves and how God sees us. See, the first followers of Jesus, man, they were onto something. They were onto something. They came to discover that what Jesus was after and that what Jesus came to do was not to change our behavior. What Jesus came to do was to change our hearts. See, just changing our behavior, that's religion. That's just checking the boxes, doing the duty for God. That's religion. That's not what Jesus came for. He came for something much more transformational, to change our hearts, to give us a new identity. And when our hearts are changed and when our identity is changed, everything we do springs out of that place. Yes, we change our habits and all that. We, we begin to change, but it comes from a place of who we are, not just the things that we do. And time and time again, and you see the first followers of Jesus stressing, stressing in their, New Testament, in their New Testament writings to remind other followers of Jesus of who they are in Christ. Because they knew 
that if we could just trust and believe who we are in Christ, the habits and behaviors would follow. So today, that's, that's what I want to do. I just want to take a few minutes. I just want to remind you. I want to remind you of who you are in Christ, your identity. Before you jump into any outcomes you want to see this year, to just start the year off by being reminded of who you are. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, he was one of the very first followers who tried to articulate as clearly as he could possibly articulate what Jesus Christ has done for us and its meaning in a particular letter that he wrote for followers of Jesus living in the city of Rome in the first century. And what he wrote in this one little passage we're going to look at today, what he wrote is so rich in its implications for who we are in light of Christ's work. And so I'd love for you to see this for yourself. It's Romans chapter 5. If you, uh, mobile device, you can scroll there, Romans chapter 5. If you don't have a Bible, there's some in the seats around you if you're in one of our buildings. It's page 860. Romans chapter 5. I'd just love for you to see this. I think this is so powerful, the things that Paul describes here. For any of us who just need to be reminded today of who we are. Romans chapter 5. Look at verse um, 6. I'm going to read I'm going to read five or six verses just kind of out of the gate here, and then I'm just going to come back and make some observations about a few of these. It says this in verse 6. It says, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time, and he died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person. Those, someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who was especially good, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Paul's saying, look, there's a lot of ways that love can demonstrate itself by sacrificing itself for another, but most people, they wouldn't even be willing to sacrifice for someone who's a great person, but God did it for people who were horrible people. That's how much his love, that's how far his love goes. And then he says, and because of that, look at verse nine, and since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his, of his son. And then he kind of wraps it up by saying this. So now we can rejoice. You can have joy. You can have peace in your life in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends with God. Now, a couple observations. You know, three different times in those five or six verses we just read, three different times Paul talks about the initiative that God has taken in Christ to pursue you, and to pursue me. Do you notice what he said a few times? He says, when we were utterly helpless. Then again, a few verses later, he said, when we were still sinners. And then a few verses later, when, while we were still his enemies. That's when God did something on your behalf. And let me just ask you a a question, have you ever felt stuck in life? You ever felt like you just find yourself doing the same thing over and over again even though you know it's not productive, it's not helpful, even though you know it hurts people, even though you know it hurts yourself, even though you know it's putting distance between you and God and yet there you are again doing it. You ever felt that sense of helplessness? You know what Paul's saying here is Jesus didn't give himself for you once you became strong enough to help yourself. He says, while you were helpless, while we were actively stuck, unable to pull ourselves up out of the patterns that were hurting us and hurting others, that's when he reached for you. While you were helpless. You ever felt the sting of shame because of decisions you've made? You ever felt the shame that comes with choices that we know are destructive, that have hurt people, that have hurt ourselves? Well, Paul is saying, while you were a sinner. He says, Jesus doesn't forgive you once you become forgivable. That's not good news. He doesn't clean us up only after we start cleaning ourselves up a little bit. He offers his forgiveness while we were still in the depth of our sin. You ever felt like an enemy of God? I read that one when it's like, while we were still God's enemies, and I'm sitting there reading that, I'm like, I'm not an enemy of God. Like, that's a little strong language there, Paul. Like, I'm not an enemy of God. But if it helps you, here's how you can think about enemy of God. It's a season of your life. You ever had a season of your life where you just had zero interest in God? Been there. 
Absolutely no, not interested in God. And what Paul's saying here is Jesus doesn't extend or offer friendship to you once you finally start to show interest in him. He offers his friendship, his brotherhood, his love, even while we actively reject him. Here's the point, man. You want to sum all this up? Here, here's the point. God does not ask us to meet him halfway. He doesn't ask you to meet him halfway. God does not help those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. Some of you are like, I thought that was in the Bible. No, that's just what your grandma told you, right? To get you to behave, right? That's nowhere in the Bible. God doesn't help those who help themselves. And Jesus, he has come to help those who finally admit they cannot help themselves. That there's nothing they can do. That they are the throes of grace. And guys, just lean in for a second. Please hear this, hear this, hear this. You gotta hear this. Do you know what this means? It means that your sin and your helplessness and even your opposition to God, all that does is activate God's heart of love for you. It doesn't repel his heart from you. And I want you to hear that because sometimes we think that our sin pushes God away but what this is saying is that our sin actually draws God closer. That he begins to run after you. That you cannot repel him. Because his love is too deep for that. Thinking that God would be repelled by our sin, that's kind of like thinking about a doctor who would be repulsed by the sights of wounds and, you know, and, and, and that he would push the wounded away. No, 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 that's what a doctor does, man. A doctor runs to the wounded and says, that's why I'm here, because I can help and I can heal. And God runs towards you and towards me. Even in all our brokenness, he's re he reaches for us even when we have pushed him away. Which begs the question, why? Why would God ever do that? And Paul answered it right in the middle of that passage we just read. Remember what he said in verse 8? He said, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In other words, God wanted to bring his love into clear view for you. He wanted to show you how much he loves you. He wanted us to know just how far his love would stretch for us. And the only way in which that kind of love could be experienced would be in high definition, flesh and blood reality. Jesus stepping into this world. You know, I, I don't know about you, man, but it, I, for me at least, I, mean, I guess that some of you are like this, man, we, we are so cynical and we are so skeptical of true love. And I understand why. We come by it honest because we've been hurt. We've been hurt way too many times, even by the people who truly love us. The reality is we know this. Nobody loves us perfectly. We've been abandoned. We've had our trust broken. We've been hurt. We've been let down, even by people who love us. In other words, every single one of us could share stories right now. If you were to take a moment and share a story, we could all share stories of those times where we know we have reached the limit of love of someone else. Even people close to us, we know that we reached their limit. And because of that, there is in the human heart as compelled and as intrigued and as inspired as we might be right now when we hear about this kind of love that God has for us, and we want to believe it, and yet there is in the human heart this small seed of doubt that it could really be that good. There's a piece of us that wonders where the light, where the limit to God's love might be. And that's why Paul is wanting to drive home this point here. He's saying that there's no limit. This is a love that would be driven to the point of death. You can't go further than that which means there's no limit to the sacrifice that this love of God would not make for you. Which is why Paul, I think, wrapped up this passage with those words we read just a moment ago. I mean, the last statement he just said, so now, in light of all that, we can rejoice. We can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ made us friends with God. So now, so now, in light of that, because, you know, because, so now because of what he has done, you are not who you used to be. 
You've been brought near to God. So now, in light of every, all of what Jesus has done, because you are loved beyond measure, so now, God has met you where you are, and he has loved you fully there, so you can be at peace. Because you're new. You're a friend of God. You can be, do you know what kind of assurance that brings? No anxiety. No fear with that. He's saying you can be assured that it was love that brought you near to God and it's love that keeps us near. Paul's describing an assurance of our nearness and friendship with God. He's saying, man, you've been made new. It has been settled on the cross. You have been brought near and not because of anything you did, which means you're not getting shoved away because of anything you do either. His love brought you close and his love will bring you and keep you near. Guys, listen, the change that we need most and the change that we desire most always starts here with what we believe to be most true about ourselves. And as first followers of Jesus, as Paul articulated here, they were transformed by the love of Jesus and how it redefined their identity and what was most true about them. Here's what it means. If you're in Christ, here's what it means for you. You can say this with confidence. I'm not who I was. I am loved beyond measure. And I am a new person in Christ. I'm not who I was. Yeah, but Jason, you don't know what I've done. I still mess up. That's not what we're talking about. That's outcomes. We're not talking about that. We're talking about identity. You're not who you were. You are loved beyond measure. You are a new person in Christ. So let me just ask you a question. Which one of those statements do you most need to hear your heavenly Father whispering into your heart today? Which one is your heart longing to hear? I'm not who I was. Does your past have you arrested? And you need to be freed today by the truth that you are not who you used to be. That you've been made right with God through Christ. That he reached for you even when you wouldn't reach for him. You're not who you were. Maybe for you it's that you're loved beyond measure. Does your past and the decisions you've made in the past, do that, does it have you arrested to the lie that there's any part of you that keeps you from being loved? Guys, listen, the cross that Jesus endured, the suffering on the cross, we just sang about that a moment ago, the son of suffering, the suffering that Jesus endured on your behalf, thinking of you, with you in mind, that is the most visible demonstration of God's love for you and just how far it would go. There are no limits to his love. You are loved beyond measure. Or maybe you need to hear today, I'm, I'm new in Christ. That you can live with the assurance that you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God, a friend. That's who you are. You're chosen. You are a child of the king. You are new in every way. Guys, that, that's who you are when you're in Christ. I'm not who I was. I am loved beyond measure. And I am a new person in Christ. And do you know what this means? This means that we can do things out here. The outcomes will change. The habits will shift. The perspective, like we'll live differently as a result. You can forgive others now. That's an outcome we want, right? I want to move past that. I want to begin to forgive other people because I'm bitter and all this kind of stuff. You can forgive others now. When you get this right here, who you are, you can forgive others not to get more of God's favor, but you begin to forgive others because you know that you've already been forgiven. When you get this right here, you can begin to give generously, not because you have to, but because Jesus already gave himself for you. That's who you are. When you get this, you can commit to praying more or reading the Bible more, not to get God's favor, but because you just wanna know more deeply the one who knows you and loves you as you are. 
There's nothing to do. There's only something to trust here, something to believe. And any goals we set to grow closer to God in this season, it is not because God is distant and we need to do something for God. It is precisely the opposite. It's because God is already close and we already have all of his love. So today, I think it's fitting to take some time and just pause and reflect on that limitless love available to us in Christ. And we're gonna do that by taking communion together as I mentioned earlier. And some of you, you may have grown up in traditions where you called it the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, but no matter kind of what you refer to it as, it's really just a symbolic way of us remembering what Jesus has done for us on the cross, the ultimate display of love. And to help us remember what he did for us on the cross, Jesus actually, he actually gave instructions in how we are to remember him. He, he tells us to take bread and to take a drink, and the, and the bread is to help us to remember, to remember his body, to remember his life, to remember the fact that he gave his life for us. And the cup or the drink, that's to help us remember his blood, because it's through his blood that our sin problem is resolved. It's through his blood that our sins are forgiven. It's through his blood that the payment was made. And it's through his blood that was poured out for us that we can now have our stories rewritten, new identity. And there's nothing magical or special about the bread and the juice. The bread is just that, it's just bread. The juice is just that, it's just juice. It's what they represent though that is so deeply meaningful. But before we eat and we drink, let me just give you a quick word of caution. God actually cautions us, tells us in the scriptures that before we eat and drink, we, we ought to take a moment and just be quiet and make sure that we're coming to God with a clean heart. And God says that we can have a clean heart. We can have a clean heart when we confess to him what we know to be sin in our lives. So I don't know where you are today in your life. Maybe for you, it's greed has kind of made its way into your heart. And you're using people now to move forward in different ways. And maybe for you, it's just, it's the way that you've spoken to people or about people. That you know it's just been wrong. Maybe it's anger or bitterness that's kind of got shackles around you today. You've been clinging to it. Or maybe it's painting outside the line sexually. Maybe for you, it's jealousy or pride. I don't know. I know what it is for me. I don't know what it is for you. I just know we all got something. And God says to just take a moment and come clean before him and confess what you know to be sin in your life. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna pray in just a second. And then I'm gonna just give you a few moments to talk to God. Just be quiet, to come clean before him. And if you wanna go ahead and grab the juice and the wafer that you were handed on the way in at any of our buildings, then go ahead and grab that. Or if you're at home and you wanna get you know, your juice and cracker ready, don't do anything with it yet. Just, just have it ready, just hold on to it. And, and after we take some time to be quiet before God, the band's gonna come and they're gonna sing over us. And then we're gonna all take it together. But right now, let's just be quiet. And let's just take some time to ask God to show us where we need his grace today, where we need his mercy to come clean before him. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you that we can approach you with confidence and without fear. Even though we are helpless, even though we've rejected you at times, even though we have made decisions that have put distance between us and you, you have bridged that gap, you have come after us, you have reached for us. So that we would know that we are loved so thank you that we don't have to, our sin, it doesn't have to force us into a corner to hide from you today. It can be brought out into the open before you without fear. Because your love and your forgiveness and your grace will swallow it up. So God, point out, show us, shine light right now. Show us, are there things in our life to put us at odds with you, with others. Show us, God, if there's sin so we can come clean before you.
There was a day when hope felt lost, a perfect savior and all a cross. In his arms he carried them, but the cross was not his final place of rest, for he knew. You haven't done so yet um, you can go ahead and pull back that thin layer on the top of the cup to find your bread like wafer <laughs> as we eat the bread we remember what Jesus has done for us remember what Jesus has done for you remember that he has reached for you long before you ever reached for him on the night before he died, Jesus took the bread and he said that this is my body, which is for you. It's given, it's broken. Eat this in remembrance of me.
And as we drink, remember that Jesus shed his blood in order to make it possible to call you his son, to call you his daughter. And on the night before he died, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is it's the new covenant in my blood. So drink this in remembrance of me. So Jesus is with hearts that are full of gratitude and thanks that we remember today just how far your love was willing to go for us. We remember that there is no depth, there is no distance, there is no, there, there, there is no extreme that we could go, that you will not find us, that you will not pursue us, that you, your love cannot reach in and change. We remember today that you have changed who we are, you have transformed our hearts, you have changed our identity. We are not who we used to be. We are loved beyond measure, and we are new in you, Jesus. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you were willing to do what we would never do and go the distance that we would never go. You were willing to give it all for us. And no one forced you to do that. You chose to, out of love, to bring us back to our Heavenly Father. We say thank you, thank you, thank you. And it is your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Well, listen, if you're in one of our rooms, I, I would love to ask you to stand right now as we wrap up our time. And I want to ask you to stand because we just want to sing. We want to sing to continue to focus on what Jesus has done for us on the cross. So let's stand together and let's sing to the one who has reached for us with his great, great love. start by remembering who we are because of who Christ is, that we are not who we used to be, that we are loved beyond measure, and that we are new in Christ. And let's allow those truths of our identity in Christ to become how we see ourselves so that anything we do for God is never to gain more of his love, but rather it's done because we already are loved. So if you're here today and there's anything you'd like to pray about, we'd love to have the opportunity 
to pray for you. And so if you're in one of our rooms down at the front left, there's people who'd love to pray with you today as soon as we're done. And if you're joining us online, just submit a prayer request on the LCBC app or on our website, and we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you. And don't forget, do not forget, next week, we're kicking off a brand new series called When Your Back's Against the Wall. Guys, it is going to be such a helpful roadmap for any of us who've ever felt a little bit stuck or overwhelmed by the circumstances that have us feeling like we're cornered every now and then. So I hope that you'll be there and hope that you'll bring someone with you. Until that time, LCBC, may the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Thank you so much for being here. Happy New Year. See you next week.